Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's been a really peculiar week. We've been rushing to get the steeple complete, and I can't believe that as they walked off the site at the end of this week, the snow came just in the nick of time. But we're going to dedicate that steeple this morning, come hell or high water or snow. But I think I might have been in a funny place this week with lots of things happening, lots of people at my door with lots of problems, lots of illness, a death. A very close friend of mine died this week too. And I had prepared a sermon for Christ the King And I kept reading it and reading it and reading it. And it just didn't seem to go where I want. I thought it wasn't a bad sermon, but it really wasn't what I was looking for. Not the way I felt. So I wrote another sermon. And there was some good stuff in this. It was about an accident in New Zealand. And I thought I could link what I read on the internet, on MSN the other day, about this fascinating situation where someone crashed their car and four hours later, standing covered in blood by the side of the road, nobody took a blind bit of notice. And the question was asked by a commentator, I wonder how many religious people went past that man covered in blood who would have claimed Christ as their king? Not much of a sermon. And then I came to think about monarchs and monarchy being a Brit living in the USA. And I thought, well, I've done that before. But I came across a wonderful quotation. And it was coined in 1952 by a man my father used to speak a lot about from his time in the Royal Air Force. My father was stationed in Egypt, in Alexandria. And he used to tell me wonderful stories as I was a boy about King Farouk. You remember King Farouk of Egypt? Apparently, in 1952, just before he was overthrown, King Farouk said, the whole world is in revolt. And soon, there will only be five kings left in the world. The king of England, the king of spades, the king of clubs, the king of hearts, and the king of diamonds. And I was going to talk to you about what happened in 1925 and how Pope Pius XI, I think, was it? Promulgated the Feast of Christ the King. Picking up the pieces after the Great War to end all wars. That didn't seem to go anywhere either. So I have to be honest, on Friday, in desperation in my office, I went to the internet And as I scoured different things about kingship, oh, and there was another problem, because on Saturday morning, that's right, I got an email from a priest friend in England offering me his sermon for today. And Maggie knows this priest well. She says, you can't preach that. Although it started off well, picking up themes about the Arthurian legend. But I thought, I couldn't preach that either. Because something in me was trying to say, something different about Christ the King. And here I am, decked up in all this gold and stuff, but that wasn't really where I wanted to go with the Feast of Christ the King. I wanted to be a little more somber, perhaps even a little more personal, because the gospel today I've just read to you isn't a gospel about a king sitting on a throne. It's about a king of love who is crucified. And in year C, when we get to Luke, we have that kind of strange juxtaposition of a king who reigns from a cross. And it looks like defeat. It's almost a contradiction in terms. So I started looking around for some ideas, thinking that God might give me some inspiration. And I don't know why this happened, but I came across some writings of an Irish priest who probably by today's standards wouldn't be very politically correct, a southern Irish priest who was writing about the Easter Rising of 1916. 
Now, I don't know how many of you in here have Irish ancestry. I know one, at least, that does. But this was a funny time for Brits, and I started to read, and sooner or later, I found myself on the University of Dublin website, where some scholars have done some incredible research by bringing together actual letters written by the insurrectionists of that Easter rebellion or the Easter uprising in Dublin in 1916. And the priest I was reading about was almost bragging about his own family connections with the way in which they brought the Brits down, or at least they brought the English down, to be more accurate. Because the Easter Rise, if you don't know anything about it, was an insurrection that was staged in Easter week of 1916, and it was mounted by Irish Republicans with the aim of bringing to an end British rule in Ireland, in Southern Ireland in particular, seceding from the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, and establishing, of course, the Irish Republic. At the time that this was being planned, we were fighting the First World War, so there was a huge diversion for troops and so on not to be able to necessarily easily put down such a rebellion. And it was perhaps, some people, some commentators would say, the most significant uprising in Ireland since the Great Rebellion of 1798. I grew up as a boy hearing all of the time on the news on a daily basis of the latest things that the IRA were doing on the mainland in the UK, blowing up Horse Guards Parade or whatever it was. So for an English boy, there was all sorts of kind of mixed emotions for me. The more I went into the university website, I came across all of these writings, and there's actually facsimile copies on the internet, uh, photocopies of the letters that were written by some of these insurrectionists to their loved ones, literally just before they were executed by the English. That made me rethink the whole question of the last words of Jesus from the cross. This day you will be with me in paradise. And then I started to read some of these interesting letters. Last words, if you think about them, are often much, much more poignant than anything that you say when you are in the middle of your life. It was William Shakespeare who said in Richard II, the tongues of dying men enforce attention like deep harmony. The tongues of dying men enforce attention like deep harmony. That took my mind to the college martyr we had in our college, my seminary. Father Vivian Redridge, which I've told you about perhaps on weekdays here in the past. A young priest who was in Papua New Guinea when the Japanese invaded. And he had every opportunity of getting out and getting on a boat to freedom. But he said, tomorrow is Sunday and I must say mass for my people. He stayed in Papua New Guinea. The Japanese came and Vivian Redlich was killed, beheaded on Buna Beach. But what's interesting was, literally minutes or so before he died, Vivian Redlich, with a pencil, not a pen, scribbled his last letter home to his mum and dad back in Leicestershire in England. His father was a priest, an Anglican priest, rector of Little Bowden in Leicestershire. And this very simple letter, written in pencil, says, I don't know what's going to happen here, mum and dad, Things are busting up really bad in this place. Just know that if I don't get out of it, I did my best. I stayed where I believed I should be with my people. Redlich never got back. If you get to London, go into St. Paul's Cathedral, and you can see the copy of that letter, the last letter of Father Vivian Redlich to his mum and dad. So last words are indeed 
poignant, and I think as Shakespeare says, the tongues of dying men enforce attention like deep harmony. So as I started to look at these letters on the internet, there was something there from a guy called Joseph Plunkett, and he wrote these words to his fiance. That is all I have time to say. I know you love me, and I am so happy. That's his last words to his beloved. Another insurrectionist by the name of Patrick Pierce wrote to his mother, Goodbye again, my dear, dear mother. May God bless you for your great love for me and for your great faith. And may he remember all that you have bravely suffered. I hope soon to see Papa, and in a little while we shall all be together again. Your son, Pat. And then one of the main leaders of that Easter rebellion of 1916 was an Irishman called James Connolly. And he was executed in Kilmainham Jail on the 12th of May in 1916. And the surgeon who was attending him before he was executed asked Connolly to pray for him and to pray for the men who would execute him. And Connolly, this radical Irish freedom fighter, said, Yes, sir, I'll pray for all brave men who do their duty according to their lights. Yes, sir, I'll pray for all brave men who do their duty according to their lights. The words from the cross, the last words of Jesus, I think, have a kind of added gravity because of his imminent death. All the words of Jesus, of course, have a gravity. This day you will be with me in paradise. The final reprieve for a guilty man who had uttered only one sentence, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Because death was so near, this sentence, only eight words long, I think gathers all the virtues of faith and hope and repentance together. Remember Zacchaeus in the gospel story? Remember Peter in the gospel stories? It only took a look of compassion from Jesus and that was enough to change Zacchaeus' heart and also the human heart of Peter, the man who denies knowing his Lord. The words that Jesus speaks, his last words from the cross, are, I think, words for all time and for all eternity. They are for me, and I hope they are for you, an assurance too that Jesus is holding out his hand in friendship to me and to you and to the world till that moment that I cannot draw another breath. And for me, the last words of Jesus signify a most powerful truth of the gospel. But it's a controversial truth. Nobody is lost. Nobody is is lost. Someone this week put on Facebook an interview with the English kind of, I don't know what, how you do, comedian, sometimes TV interviewer, Russell Brand, not my favorite guy, the son of the rectory, he's a son of a priest. He interviewed two men from Westboro Baptist Church. And if you don't know what Westboro Baptist Church is about, it's that wacky group of hardline evangelicals that go around protesting at gay soldiers' funerals and disrupting their funerals. It's a wacky group that says, God hates fags. Russell Brand, obviously, was playing Advocatus Diaboli, the devil's advocate, and he was pushing them. And so he said, I have some questions for you. And I thought this was a stage thing at first, till I watched on and realized not at all. I want you to tell me, he said, which of these people is going to go to heaven and which is going to go to hell? And he started off 
Madonna. Hell. And they had no compunction of saying, Madonna's going to go to hell for all the things she's done. Russell Brand made some comment, and then he said, OK, let's go on back to the list. Gandhi. And they said, hell, even more so than Madonna, because he wasn't a Christian. And so it went on about who was in and who was out. And there's me trying to struggle in my thinking about what I want to say about Christ, the universal king of love today. And there wasn't a scrap of love in the voices and in the sentiments that were expressed by these two guys from Westboro Baptist Church. Maggie said, you've never liked Russell Brand, but he's just gone up in your estimation. I said, sure has. You see, my hunch is that when Jesus, with his last words on the cross, says, today you will be with me in paradise, he's saying that nobody is lost. That takes me, too, into conflict with the Diocese of Albany. But I believe that there is always a chance, always a last chance, because the nature of the God who gives us his last words from the cross are those of reassurance. Today, you will be with me in paradise. And that's not just to Paul Blanche. It's not just to one of you. It is to the world. We know that Admiral Nelson allegedly said, kiss me, Hardy, as his last words. Well, lucky Hardy. But Jesus says these powerful words. But on another level, of course, when you look, I wonder if the disciples thought, hang on a minute, is this all there is? Is this the end of that adventure we've had with Jesus? Is this the end of that which we've given the best years of our lives to? Perhaps each one of us in our heart at times searches for a meaning in catastrophe. What looks like a failure, when you hear those words of Jesus, there's hope. The death of Jesus, the apparent failure of his earthly life, flies in the face of everything that men and women have valued throughout the world. And some would even say, what a tatty kingdom this king has. What a contradiction Christianity seems to be sometimes, that the king of love reigns from a cross, the instrument of human torture, a sign of defeat. But because we hear the last words of Jesus, even the cross becomes the symbol of victory. The cynical have always scoffed at the cross, and of our Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross. The throne, which we often say, the throne of the cross, is by anybody's standard an incongruous one at that. Incomprehensible, yes, to every unbeliever. His kingdom was not of this world, and therefore wasn't always immediately recognizable, except to the one that looked on Jesus through the eyes of faith. Today, you will be with me in paradise. King Farouk was wrong. Jesus will be forever our universal king, but our king of love.